regular, regular, regular features. A regular, regular, regular features. A regular, regular, regular features. A regular features of show. Hello and welcome to Regular Features, the podcast, as you well know, that is the same every week. Every week. I'm every single goddamn week. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. It's the same podcast. Are you... Are you playing the Greek chorus, Steve? Like you're questioning whether <laughs> it doesn't change. It doesn't change. I don't believe it. Well, maybe they should try it because it's not very good. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, Christ. No. You love it. That's why you're here. I'm John Blythe. In one of the other Zoom windows is. <laughs> you got a oh, point. You can't do that with a delay, <laughs> mate. You're not in the same order. You could, you could be in the. You're in the middle to me, Steve. Go on, Steve. Tell him who you are. My name is Steve Hogarty, and I'm the tallest one. Fucking hell! <laughs> you can just say what you like. <laughs> my name's Joe Scrabbles, and I've got the most flowers in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has come from a recent Animal Crossing game. That's why that's mm. fresh in your fucking head, isn't it? Has anyone got features today on all days a Friday? I have been far too horny to have a feature, so I'll be telling you all about that. (sighs) I'll be telling you about how nature's returned in one of the most heartwarming tales you'll hear this coronavirus. Oh, God, that sounds so sexy. My dang horse has got died. Oh, somebody tell me where my feature's gone. And now it's time for Steve's regular feature, Steve's Sad Horse News. Mm. Oh no. Uh I've got some sad news today. My pet horse and lifelong companion, Japser, has died. (laughs) Jaspo was 73 in horse years, so he had what many would say are good innings living a long and fulfilling life among the mulberries and oleander of the windswept roof terrace of the 24-storey tower block in northwest London we called home. <laughs> Jonker fell all 24 stories to his untimely death on Tuesday morning at approximately 3 a.m., according to London's second-best horse coroner. <laughs> His giant horse body landed on a double-parked Mitsubishi, impacting at such a high speed that he immediately disintegrated into a fine pink mist that even now hangs above the entrance to the parking bays like an inhalable memory. (laughs) Jodhpur, what made you lose your footing that night? Yes, you have been known to giddily scoot along the ledges of the building after your nightly feed of oats, freezing momentarily at each of the four corners to pose like a horse gargoyle. But you've never put a hoof wrong before. Your sense of balance was a matter of public record. The roof terrace, a veritable assault course of interconnected seesaws, tight ropes, and lazy Susans. Anything to keep you engaged. We would do anything for you, Jenga. And we did. <laughs> they never found your third hoof, Jojo. The first was embedded in the catalytic converter of the Mitsubishi's 2.4-litre engine, which the mechanic said would never sound the same again. The second, through a quirk of Newtonian physics, was catapulted directly upwards back along the same path you'd taken down, landing right back on top of the roof terrace you'd fallen from, like hoof pence change from a horse pound coin. (laughs) What? The fourth hoof was sent into a suborbital trajectory, landing many thousands of miles away in the headdress of a visiting foreign dignitary during a United Nations banquet honouring the efforts of horse charities around the world to reduce the number of hooves being lopped off to be used as exotic fascinators at banquets. (laughs) Judas, I don't think you fell that night. I've seen you effortlessly parkour over a bench like it wasn't even there, land on a skateboard and do a loop-de-loop near a stuffy college professor, instantly turning him fun. (laughs) I've watched you delicately perform Chopin's Nocturne Opus 9 on crystal wine glasses, all alone, the moonlight dancing in your giant protruding eyes like a torch shining on a pair of wet golf balls. You didn't know I was watching you that night, Jabo, but I was. I was always looking out for you. When they found what was left of you, dripping down the side of a Londus, 
They called me. <laughs> Do you know where I was, Jaden? I was already far, far away. I was grieving, here on the white sand beaches of Phuket, trying to start a new life for myself in a new country. The million pound horse life insurance policy I took out has done little to mend my broken heart, but it can at least give me the distance I need to begin to move on. Anyway, jump rope, I must sign off. My harem of straight femme horse boys has arrived to jerk me off to completion, and I'm paying them by the minute. I might be a millionaire now, but I'm not made of money. It's all about balance, isn't it, Gillette? You taught me that. And at least I'll always have a piece of you inside me. Because I ate the third hoof what had my fingerprints on it. <laughs> Rest in peace, Julep. Your friend, Steve. Oh, I never really thought about how all horses are doing parkour almost all the time. <laughs> it's constant yeah. parkour, just to move from A to B. They're thought- all... French acrobats. <laughs> I've just never thought about how in every horse crime there are always four hooves to account for. Mm. And like, a lot of, always... lot of extra work <laughs> for the horse cops. <laughs> uh, I do have to point out that, once again, every time one of us brings up a hoof, Steve, the other one has hooves in their feature. We're both hoof I've got... crazy. And I nearly mentioned Ban Ki-moon, who is in the UN. <laughs> And I I took him out because I thought, you know what? I bet Steve's going to write about the UN. I I remember the last time you both shared your surprise that you'd both had horses in your features. Maybe it's time to realise that we just love horses as a podcast and should never never find surprise. Mine's a different hoofed animal. I'm just going to... I moved away from the horse life. I'm but not gonna, far away enough that they don't have hooves. I'm just control effing my feature for horse. No, there's no horses in it. <laughs> but Congrats. But it's like background radiation. I wouldn't even notice if I had put a horse in. Mm. No, it would just be there. Yeah. Like, without you knowing, you'd look back and there was a horse in the feature. <laughs> Getting closer. More prominent. I fucking love horses. Funny they'll, they'll never not make me laugh. <laughs> idiots. Big long idiots. <laughs> but as long as they need to be for their height and depth, Joe, shut up. Depth? Yeah, as in the Z axis, not personality wise. <laughs> They've got no brains. <laughs> Have you ever looked into a horse's eyes? Nothing there. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> Couldn't hold a conversation if they dried. They eat out of bags strapped to the back of their heads. <laughs> and they shit into another bag strapped to their ass. At least they did in Austria when I went there. What? But yeah, that's it. It's bag to bag eating. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a, the laziest horsing centipede. Like they couldn't even be asked to put the other horses on them. It's not lazy. It's just a horse centipede that just doesn't like relying on other horses. Yeah, there was just a, to stop it shitting all over the road I believe just, yeah, uh, there was just a bag on its ass. if someone okay. strapped food to my face and a bag to my ass, <laughs> I'd, I'd really feel like quite... a million bucks I'd, I'd like... feel like a king <laughs> yeah you could just go couldn't you nothing could stop you <laughs> sure there'd be moments where you questioned your ability to look after yourself but fuck <laughs> it <laughs> but this three bean chilli is delicious <laughs> yeah that, that would get me to John O'Groats <laughs> That's how you do a marathon. You just strap a bag of chilli to your face and it's constant release energy. Yeah. <laughs> strap a bag of onto each hand with things I like to touch and I'm just there for the day. I'm set for the day. Things you like to touch? <laughs> yeah. Well, like what? I don't know, sort of like curdled milk with little hard bits in it. <laughs> <laughs> Just a mix of textures. How is that the first thing you thought of for things you like to touch? <laughs> Maybe I've been thinking about it. You're ill. <laughs> features. The regular features. These are the episodes of the regular features podcast. The continuing mission to find a feature worth repeating, to seek out new features and regular features, to boldly feature where no feature had featured before, regular featured before. Regular features! Regular features! 
Regular, regular features. Regular features. Regular features. Just regular. Regular features, regular features, Have you noticed uh, everyone saying that the world is healing without us in it? Mm. Like how there are swans in Venice. Nature's and, returning. Yeah. Reeds growing, yeah, uh, off an antenna. A slug's not on fire. A slug crawled up the pipe from our sump pump into the sink in the cellar. What a and legend! I, I thought mm, nature is healing. <laughs> we are the virus. <laughs> uh, my bath, well, my bath won't drain properly anymore. Nature is healing. Nature is healing. <laughs> <laughs> the bath is returning to its natural state of always having some water in it, like a pond. <laughs> it's little plug holes healed over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. In my, oh, no, not going into it. It's too much of a flood to fancy, but it's gross. That's a 10-minute detour we don't need to take. <laughs> also, because also we're about to take a 10-minute detour of a flight of fancy that was written very much along similar lines. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to present to you my favourite story of nature's return to the streets. <clears throat> uh, and it's in a familiar format. You are a nine-year-old elk called Dominic. The first elk born in Britain in around three to four thousand years. Your Scandinavian parents were introduced back to the Scottish wilderness in 2011, did an elf fuck, and got their moose baby a British passport. You've pretty much had the run of the place ever since, being the only British elk and all. You eat all the best moss, you can clomp around pretty much wherever you like, and you've got 4G in your antlers. You're pretty much the poshest elk around, a real little Lord Fontelmoose. <laughs> But there's one thing you've never been able to do, posh as you are. Ironically, it's the poshest thing that you can do, and it haunts you. <laughs> but recently, you picked up a news broadcast on your antlers. It said that humans had retreated indoors and nature was returning to the streets. Goats in Landudno, puffins in a spire, dormice <laughs> eating like people in Italian restaurants. If ever there was a time to make your posh elk dreams a reality, it was now. I present to you a choose-your-own-adventure. You are an elk and you want to go to Harrods. Puffins in a spire? Is that a real thing? <laughs> no. Oh, thank God, thank God for that. <laughs> I thought I'd missed out on some hot puffin locations. Uh, I can't guarantee this feature wasn't written entirely because I realised that you are an elk and you want to go to Harrods scans with uh, Get Back by the Beatles. You are an elk and you want to go to Harrods. Want to go to Harrods, elk. <laughs> <laughs> Harrods is a long way from Scotland, even for your elegant long elk legs, Dominic. You'd better plan a route. Do you A, go north away from Harrods, or B, go south toward Harrods? Right. Steve. Well, weighing up our priorities, I believe moving towards Harrods will sooner reach our goal of getting to Harrods. I will say that I've fully written this. You can choose whatever you like. Let's go away from Harrods. Go, uh, yeah, I want, I want to see if there's an achievement for going the wrong direction in the first <laughs> instance. Yeah, there's probably like a skill upgrades and all sorts of it's things. It's like when you walk left at the start of a platformer. You walk north, <laughs> taking in the increasingly mountainous sights of the Scottish Highlands. Yes, Harrods isn't this way, but you're pretty sure things are going to work out all right. Just as you begin to grin an elk grin, you slip on a dewy thistle and fall down the mountain you're on, which was Ben McDwee, the highest, wait, the second highest mountain in Scotland. The force of your tumble rolls you all the way to the A1, where a sign says London. And you know what London means? It means Harrods. <laughs> you walk south down the A1, which eventually becomes the A1M. Soon... You are at Harrods. You made it. Your dreams have come true. Nature has returned to the streets of London and an elk is going into Harrods. The end. Oh, I can only imagine how much shorter... You are would... Mohammed Al-Fayed and you're about to see an elk outside your bedroom window, which is at the very top of Harrods. Holy shit. 
You are 91-year-old Mohammed Al-Fayed, former chairman of Harrods and now just an old man that lives in the pointy bit above the dome on the shop's roof, like the pigeon woman from Home Alone 2. You've just shuffled to the room's window that overlooks Brompton Road to take in the strange sight of an empty, quiet London. I never thought I would see London like this, you muttered to yourself. In all my many years on Brompton Road, I never once saw it empty at any time. What strange times we live at. <laughs> Is that an elk? <laughs> Is that <an> elk? <laughs> Do you, Mohammed Al Fayed, A, get your old gun and try to shoot the elk from your window? Or B, tutty yourself for even thinking about killing such a majestic creature with an old gun, run down through Harrods in your nightgown, get a sword from the sword department, and throw open the front doors of Harrods to take on the elk, mano a mano. I would get the massive mod, the model swordfish that's on the wall in the fish section of Harrods, and I'd go, go at him with that. <laughs> Are you invoking a real terrorist event that happened where that guy got the narwhal tusk. What, I also remember seeing a swordfish in the wall at Harrods and thinking, wow, this place is posh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've only got gun or sword. Just what? pretend the swordfish is the sword and just say All right. fish after every time you say sword. Yeah. You swivel on a dime and prepare to take off running to the swordfish department. <laughs> Thank you. Where all of London's finest gentlemen buy their swordfish. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, your nightgown is very long, and when you swivel, you swivel on a trailing piece of cloth, which sends you into a full 1080 pirouette that would impress even Dave Mirror, who I think did it on a BMX. <laughs> Sadly, Dave Mirror wasn't there to see it. No one was. You bang your head on an old beam, and that seems to be pretty much it for you. R.I.P. The End. That's okay, then. There's you are an it. elk oh. that just heard a loud bang from above. <laughs> You are Hold Dominic the Elk the- again? Yeah. You okay. are Dominic the Elk again, and just as you were wondering how to open a big brass door handle with hooves, you heard a faint bang from above, followed by what might have been a cry of, Oh, fucking hell! <laughs> you, you spring into action. You boot open the Harrods door with elken force and barely have time to take in the splendour of Harrods as you bolt up its marble staircases. The only thing in your head is to get upstairs and see if anyone is hurt. You might be a posh elk, but you're not an asshole. At one point, you stumble through the department that provides robes for old secret societies and get a couple of robes stuck to your antlers, one on each. You think about getting them off by rubbing them against a wall or whatever elks do when they got stuff on their antlers, because stuff must get stuck on them, bits of tree or whatever. The big antlers, it stands to reason. But there isn't time! Finally, you find a rickety, steep old staircase up to what must be the very top of Harrods. You run to the top and slam open the door. You are now Mohammed Al Fayed, dazed from a head injury specified earlier in the story, depending on your choices. The room's spinning. Oh, fucking hell, you say, and try to get to your feet. That's our you catchphrase. Plop back- <laughs> you plop back to the floor, the world still too unstable for you to get up. You hear bangs and smashes and hoof noises from below you, but assume it's the sound of blood pumping through your big old injured head. Suddenly, the door to your room smashes open, and what seems to be two hooded floating figures emerge. Oh, Christ, you shout. There's some kind of fucking ghost coming to take me to the next world. <laughs> now you're an elk that's looking at an old Egyptian on the floor. Did that man just talk about ghosts? Your English isn't great, but you're pretty sure that's what you heard. You take a hoof step closer. Oh no, I ain't done enough down here. Please leave me for a few months at least. You shake your big head and antlers at him to tell him that you are not some ghosts on antlers. (laughs) You are now Mohammed Al Fayed and the ghosts are wobbling angrily. I've never done a bad thing in my life, I swear. You realise you're crying. I always try to do my best, and I actually think I my parrot's pretty nice for everyone. There's a heavy scent in the air, a muddy woodland musk. You think it must be the scent of an empty grave. Please take pity on an old Egyptian. Please don't take me, please. You're an elk again, and you've just realised who this man is. That voice, you'd recognise it anywhere. That's Mohammed Al Fayed, the ex owner of Harrods, your hero. You can't believe how lucky you are to have met Daddy Harrods and how sorry you are to see him hurt. With tremendous effort, you stand on your hind legs and scoop up Mohammed Al Fayed like a baby in your huge arms. <laughs> you are Mohammed Al Fayed and you think you've been returned to the womb. 
is this the afterlife? The ghosts are now floating at your peripheries and your current feeling is one of enormous safety and warmth. Death and rebirth, is this what you're being shown? Your time has come, but a new time is yet to come. I understand now, ghosts, you shout. I'm part of a tremendous cycle, a tide that ebbs and flows, ageing and unaging, lapping at the shores of creation. My consciousness is what one droplet in a sea of billions of souls. I'm ageing backwards, ready to begin again. This is fucking lovely. <laughs> You are an elk standing on its hind legs, almost 19 feet tall, cradling a raving Egyptian millionaire in your strong elk <laughs> arms. <laughs> As Muhammad El Fayed grinningly gibbers and yells in your arms, you carry him through Harrods, walking him through departments, past his life's most notable achievements. In a way, he is seeing his life in reverse, just not the way he talks about. A great metaphorical journey from his final days in the old dome room to the front doors he must have walked through for the first time many years before to buy this hallowed old shop. You're honoured to have been here with him. As you walk onto the cold tarmac of Brompton Street, a group of Scottish scientists who put 4G tracking equipment in your antlers when <laughs> you were a calf, gasp at the sight of a British elk walking on its hind legs with a weeping human in its arms. With panic in his voice, one of them shouts, FIRE! And a net gun's payload engulfs you both. As you tumble to the ground, you wonder why this is happening and you're frightened. Six months later, you are Mohammed El Fayed and you live life as an elk. You remember the end of that day well. You were bundled into a transit van with the netted elk. The scientists clearly keen not to allow the public to know that their rewilding project had gone so awry by allowing witnesses to escape. The elk bellowed in fear so much that you regained your faculties. You realised the elk's kindness and you realised you were expendable. You needed to formulate a plan so that you and the elk could escape. When you arrived back at the lab, you paid the scientists £12 million to let you and the elk go, no questions asked, and they did. You, Mohammed Al Fayed, now live in the woods of Scotland as an elk with an elk. It's great. The end. Regular features, regular features. What is a feature coming next? Let us see. And now, time for my regular feature. And is it just me? Or is quarantine juicing up them thigh balls over there? I don't know if I'm unique. I rather suspect I am, but there's something about being told by Boris Johnson not to go on Grinder and arrange No Limits chemsex murder parties that really chafes at my dicky doodah. <laughs> to quote status quo in 1988, I want to go bumming all over the world. <laughs> I can't explain it, there just must be something weird about the way my hormone pipes are wired into my eccentric nuts. And eccentric here means that the centre of rotation is not in the <laughs> middle of the nut. I just desire <laughs> human contact that culminates in a tiny amount of emotional piss landing on my foot. Now, wait a minute, Log. I think you'll find, if you check your sexual micrometer, that I am a really damn horny too. <laughs> and may I refer you to the readings on my spunky oscilloscope which are up the wall and out the chimney. Well, I'm glad I invited you both into my well-equipped sexual laboratory tonight. <laughs> Let's measure who is the horniest on lockdown. <coughs> I'll start. <coughs> I am so horny that I slid into a hot guy's DMs and slid all the way out the other side. I just <laughs> couldn't stop because I was so horny when I pre my ass, I got it all over my feet, too. And... Well, I'm so horny, for girls, I might add, that I finished my dinner off of my commemorative Princess Diana plate, and the sight of her beautiful face under a bit of red sauce made me yodel the national anthem so loud that it shattered my daughter's glass eye. That's nothing, Joe, who, by the way, is only to shove your straightness down our throats. I know, someone's insecure. I wish you hadn't ad-libbed that bit when I was sticking to the script. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so remorselessly horny that I saw my wet and dry Henry Hoover, and you know the face on Henry Hoover's are looking up and to the right? Well, I stood above him and to the right, brackets, his left, and said... You can't take your eyes off me, can you, you absolute whore? Then I stuck his nozzle down the bog and I made him drink it. <laughs> well done on saying and not acting brackets. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I'm so horny that I just put my hand into a fingerless mitten and acted like they were five little woolly glory holes. Then I pretended that I was Penelope Pitstop and it was the Ant Hill mob's dicks. And I said, <laughs> gentlemen, I do declare, help. I was so horny, I managed to suck my thumb while getting my little finger up my hoo-ha. Wait a minute, boys, I said. Weren't there seven members of the Ant Hill mob? Mac, Danny, <laughs> Ring a Ding, Clyde, Rug Bug, Benny, Kirby, and Willie? And the middle finger said, Yeah, Ring a Ding and Mac died. We're all extremely old now. <laughs> and I just laughed and kept sucking and fucking until Chugaboom honked his horn to say it was time for my fingers to go home. Well, I'm so horny for women. I should stress, then I just span around in my office chair and changed the speed of my rotation by extending and contracting my legs. It was so horny to be the master of my own rotational velocity. I was so horny about spinning around that I imagined the curve drawn by tracing a point on the wheel of a bicycle as the bike went along a road. And you won't believe it, lads. It was just an endless row of lovely squat tits. I got so excited that I became intensely magnetic and ripped off my daughter's iron leg. Well, I'm so horny that I stuck my <laughs> Dickie Davis into the hoop of a padlock because at that point Annie Hole seemed indistinguishable from a goal. When I heard the hooting of an owl, that reminded me that it was the night time, which is when 60% of sex happens. I got so horny that my dick exploded open the padlock. A gate swung open and I walked into a mysterious garden dominated by a hollow tree. I whispered my name into the fanny shaped hole in the tree's trunk. Steve. <laughs> Seconds later, a fruit landed on my head and said Steve back at me, and I came like a fucking waterfall. Well, that's lovely, but I'm so horny I'm drenched in blood, sweat, egg and gravy. I'm so horny that I thought you were both girls and my nuts inverted like salted slugs. I'm like Super Mario Sunshine, but with jizz. I've just piped the entire alphabet onto my prayer mat. I'm nearly finished now, don't stop. Come on, you dirty bird. Don't stop. Don't stop. Uh, stop. Okay, I'm done now. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <sighs> Same time next week? It's so hard on lockdown, isn't it? Yeah. Ooh, squirty squirty. You squirty birty. Ooh, squirty squirty. You dirty birty. Well, that's it for this week's episode of the Regular Features Podcast. We're recording the outro for perhaps the third or fourth time. It's because I keep playing the silly goose. (laughs) Yes. Yes, that's one of the reasons why. I've had an incredible time with my friends Joe and Log. Hello. Oh, oh wait, it's not the intro. I just said hello like it was the intro. <laughs> no. <laughs> you say goodbye at the end. Goodbye. <laughs> Don't say it well, yet. We haven't done. Oh, we're not done. Oh, wait. Do I have to cancel? Hello. <laughs> cancel it. <laughs> you can, that's how you cancel goodbyes. <laughs> well, how do you cancel them? They got to say goodbye twice and then uh. And walk backwards into the room. Yes, walk backwards, well, <laughs> waving. <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash regular features. And when you get there, you'll be greeted mm-hmm. with a big old page with a B on it. <laughs> yeah, hey. It's got a B on it. We must be one of the only patrons with a big B. <laughs> I, th- I think we are. I, I, I think we are, actually. You know what? I bet I can piece together outros from the shrapnel of takes that we've done. Yeah, because I like the bit about the bee. Yeah, that'd be. I'll I'll sit the bee bit in. This is going to be a Frankenstein outro. It's going to be great. Just put a sound effect between each one. An explosion sound effect. Make it feel like shrapnel. Oh, yeah. Like a reader's brains are just being <laughs> torn apart by shards of molten metal <laughs> <laughs> give them content do not give them sense ruin them <laughs> well we'll be back next week with another episode of the regular features podcast we love you goodbye